All right. So chapter 5 is, um, is going to be the histology chapter. Now, on this, um, remember that there's going to be things on here that are going to show pictures of it. Where this, the lecture test is not about pictures. Uh, there will be things on here that will talk about um, some of the tissues that will be different than maybe what we talk about in lab a little bit. But when it comes to certain things like that, it's all we're, lab's the same thing. When we talk about uh, classic places where the tissues are, the only thing I'm concerned about is what we talked about with lab. That it is the same on either side. So, anyway, chapter five. Oh, come on, Lord, hold on. Let me see this thing. So, in this, we talk about how now we've we've gotten past you know atoms and molecules and cells. Now we're looking at how cells work together to form uh, what is called tissues. Groups of similar cells with a common function are called tissues. And the general catch-all term for tissues, the study of tissues, is histology. And so when we start looking at tissues, uh, like we said in lab, there are four uh, types of tissues. We have epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscle tissue, nervous tissue. And the muscle and nervous tissue are two that we're going to just, even in here, barely touch on. All right? Again, they have their own chapters really dig into them in those chapters in here, eh, we're going to leave it, um, you know, just the basics with it. So as we start looking at it, one of the first things that's different that we see is we talk about um, the connections between tissues. Uh, there are three types of connections you need to know. I'm going to start with the one at the bottom here. These are called gap junctions. Gap junctions are areas where there's an actual hole between two cells. And it allows for communication. It allows for uh, the cytoplasm or the cytosol to go back and forth. Um, so like if my little big um, expo marker was out, I could uh, just, you know, holler, go through one of those little holes and ask, you know, hey, do you have any gray poupon or whatever. And so it allows cells. We're going to see that this is going to be one of the things in those um, – those intercalated discs in the cardiac muscle cells that allow for the fluid to go back and forth, and it allows for all of the cells to work as one unit. Right? Another one that's in those intercalated discs is this one called a desmosome. A desmosome uh, is honestly probably the key word for it is a spot weld. It is for really strong connections. Again, this is going to be big in those intercalated discs because in cardiac muscle, when it contracts, it's got to pull on the other cardiac muscle. So desmosomes are for really strong connections. And again, uh, even in, in the test, if I'm writing something out, I will refer to it as like a welded spot. And then the last one is this top picture called the tight junction. The tight junction is more like stitching. It is more for waterproofing, making a solid seal. It's not necessarily for strength. It's more in line with a, a firm, solid seal, uh, sewn together, so to speak. Um, so those are the three types of special uh, connection between the cells that we need to know right now. All right, they, they make sense? All right. All right. Tight junctions are like stitching. Desmosomes are like welded areas. Gap junctions are simply holes between uh, the two cells. Now, again, the first type of tissue we get into is epithelial tissue. Remember that it's always going to have a free surface, which means it lines the uh, cavities of hollow organs. Um, it's going to have a free surface and a basement membrane. Again, there's no pictures in here on this test. So it's going to be descriptions. Uh, remember that epithelial tissue is avascular, which means it has no direct blood supply. And um, even though it has no direct blood supply, when we look at connective tissue next, we're going to see that uh, 
um, the ability for those tissues to reproduce, to go through mitosis, um, to, for, or the cells to divide, as said another way. Um, in connective tissue, it varies depending on blood supply. In epithelial tissue, they all pretty much are all about dividing. Because again, since it's got a free surface, it's going to be taking a beating. And so, in general, they're very mitotic, it's referred to. Um, all the cells in these are tightly packed together, of course, because uh, they are working together in this. We're going to see it's very different than uh, connective tissue. Um, but the next thing is about the naming. This goes back to what we talked about in lab, about this book-wise naming of epithelial tissue, uh, that it's basically pretty straightforward. We're looking at the free surface and basement membrane, and we're counting how many cells there are between it. If there's only one cell between it, the first part of the name is simple. If it's more than one, it is called stratified. Then we name it by the shape. The shape is either squamous, which means flat, cuboidal, which means cube-like, columnar, which means column-like. The two types of tissue that don't play well with this, the one is one that has a falsely layered look. We call it pseudostratified. The other one is a type that has no definite shape. It changes the urinary bladder. This is called the transitional because the cells change their look uh, depending on uh, what is needed. And so it's, again, the basic stuff that we talked about uh, back in um, that second lab. Now, as we go through these, I'm going to kind of flip through this pretty quick. The main thing I want you to know about simple squamous, one cell layer thick of flattened cells, is that it is going to be the air sacs of the lungs. That's the classic example. There's many other places it is, but this is the classic example. Um, simple cuboidal, again, one cell layer thick of cube-like cells, kidney tubules. Are there other places? Yes, of course, but this is where I would ask it. Kidney tubules. Simple columnar epithelium. Now this is the one that we saw that was those, it was the blue and red finger-like um, tissue. Uh, one of the two blue and red uh, type tissues we have. And this is the digestive tract. That's what we talked about with it. Remember, this one had two things in the uh, tissue that you needed to know. One was that it had goblet cells. Goblet cells secrete mucus. And the other thing is it has a surface modification called cilia. Okay, so far, so good. Pseudostratified, which I kind of, you know, try to use the analogy that it is kind of like the cousin because it's similar. They're both columnar cells. This is pseudostratified. Um, and it is in the respiratory tract. And the respiratory tract and the digestive tract both share a common origin, so that's why I was kind of saying that they're like cousins. Um, this also has goblet cells. I'm not worried about whether it has cilia on it or not. Um, ah, wait a minute. I messed up. Excuse me while I move. I wish I could rewind that. Um, I messed up. I saw this up here. Ugh. Simple columnar epithelium, the blue and red, goblet cells, digestive tract, microvilli, not worried about cilia on that one. This one is the one, because it's worried about surface area. We talked about this in the chapter about the cells, the surface modifications, where um, on this it has the little um, surface, wavy surface, so the um, cytoplasm can get in and, again, increase surface area. Pseudostratified. Pseudostratified is the one that has cilia on it. It also has goblet cells. All right, I am sorry about that mistake. So, whoo. Again, maybe I'll try and edit it out of the recording, uh, but we'll see. Um, if not, it's all right. Again, I'll probably send this with a link that's like a private link, so it's just y'all because I don't know turn out. I don't want my brothers to see this. Yes? What it's saying is, again, the reason it looks pseudostratified is that if I've got the free surface and the basement membrane, the, shell, the cells have no 
definitive shape because of the goblet cells that are in there. And so I'll have nuclei up here and here and here and here. That's why at first it looked like it was stratified. Does that make sense? When we did not... Yes, yep. It's just the way it, it, it is set up, the nuclei are pushed at different levels, where in this one, pretty much, if you're looking at it, the nuclei are all basically in the same level, so it's easy to see this is simple columnar when you actually look at the cells. This one's much harder. You have to have a better microscope. Does that make sense? Yep. So that's the reason that it, they, it fooled them at first. All right, stratified squamous, stratified squamous, we said, and we're going to look at this a lot in the next chapter, this is several layers thick of flattened cells. Now, again, in the real world, we know that when we looked at this tissue, they weren't flat until the very top, but basically, that's how I would describe it, several layers thick of flattened cells. This is where we looked at it is, we said the outer part of the skin, now, um, after today, we're going to know that's the epidermis, and you knew that because of lab, right? It's the outer layer of uh, the integumentary system. We're going to talk a lot more about uh, this uh, in the next chapter. Now, this one we do not study in lab. We don't look at pictures of it. I'm not worried about you knowing it, but it is fair game as far as if I asked you what would be the name of a tissue that is multiple cell layers thick of cube-like cells, Stratified cuboidal, right? You don't have to know where it is. You don't have to know anything else about it. But it is fair game as far as me naming it. Just like the next one, which is stratified columnar. We do not look at pictures of stratified columnar epithelium. But I would expect you to know if I asked, what's the name of a type of tissue that is multiple cell layers thick of column-like cells, that you would know that stratified columnar. Does that make sense? Bless you. Then we get to transitional epithelium. Again, this is going to be stratified, but we don't have it in the name. The name simply is telling us that these cells change shape. This is going to be in the urinary bladder, and that's that. All right. So far, so good. I know I'm going kind of quick on these, but I mean, it, I'm hoping it's review. Um, this is new stuff. All right. So in lab, we don't look at glands. I briefly talked about it just a little bit uh, about when we were talking about sweat glands. Uh, but in here, right now, these are the, the uh, this is the part about glands. And we're going to be very basic on this. First of all, there's two types of glands in the body. Endocrine and exocrine. The name is a description of whether or not it has a duct. If a gland has a duct, it is called exocrine. If it does not have a duct, it is called endocrine. Now let me ask you, if I, if I said A or B, which one of those two is the endocrine system? Did you figure that one out? Which one is not the endocrine system. Exocrine. All right. So when you get into the endocrine system, you're going to look a lot at the endocrine glands. And here, I just want you to know that endocrine glands do not have a duct. Now, as far as the exocrine glands, know that there are some that are just unicellular. Um, and it's kind of weird because they're not necessarily going to have a duct, but they're just one cell that makes substance and basically they are the goblet cells so not a big deal but I figure I would hope you would know unicellular means one cell so multicellular are the ones we kind of look at and there's kind of a weird way I mean this could get very complicated we're going to keep it real simple there's two parts to the name the first part is describing whether it is only one duct or whether it is several ducts. If there is only one duct, it is called simple. If there is more than one, it is called compound. Does that make sense? So the first part is we look at the tubing system. 
if there's only one simple, if there's several or more than one, it is compound. And then the next two names that we have are describing the part that is the, the, the gland itself, the part that is secreting something. And there's really two names to it. If it looks like a tube, it is called tubular. If it looks like a balloon, it is called a velar. Now, a velar might be kind of a stretch. I mean, if you haven't studied air, the air sacs in the lungs that are called alveoli, and that's why they're called that, because they're little balloons. If you haven't studied that, maybe not. But I sure hope that everybody understands tubular means like tube. So this is these, you know, hopefully this will be, you know, really low-hanging fruit type questions almost. Right? Simple or compound, talking about the duct. The secretory portion is either a tube, tubular, or balloon-like, a VLR. All right. Now it can get more complicated than this, and I'm not gonna get it, but that's that's the basic, that's what this the book has, and I'm gonna stick with that. All right. Now, the next part, I believe we talked a little bit about when I talked about sweat glands. If not, it's not a big deal. Um, but this is one of the areas, the, the naming of this have a completely different reason they named them this, but the naming ends up working out really well. Right? There's one of three things that can happen to a secretory cell. Either it just secretes its substance and there's no cell damage, it could secrete the substance and a part of the cell is secreted, or it could secrete it and the whole cell just ruptures. Right? Now, if it only secretes a substance, it is called a miracrine gland. And you can remember that it merely secretes. If a part of the gland is released, it is called an apocrine gland. You can kind of remember a part of the cell is released in apocrine. If the whole cell ruptures, it's called holocrine. The whole cell ruptures, holocrine. Now again, this isn't the way it's named. They're not naming it for that, but it just works out really nicely like that. It merely secretes it, a part comes out, or the whole cell ruptures. Miracrine, apocrine, holocrine. Yes. Yeah. No, so this one, this type of cell called a miracrine gland, it's only going to secrete a substance. There's no cell loss with it. So you can say it merely secretes its substance. A, an apocrine gland, when it secretes its substance, a part of the cell is secreted with it. And so you can think of an apocrine gland, a part of it comes off. The type where the whole cell just bursts, the whole cell ruptures, are called holocrine glands. And again, you can remember the whole cell ruptures in a holocrine. It's nice when it works out like that. So that was the new part on glands. I think it was pretty straightforward. Everybody good with that? Woo. All right. So now we look at connective tissue. Again, just like when we looked at it in lab, I'm not going to ask you about where a lot of these are. There's the ones that I wanted you to know in lab will be the same ones I expect you to know in here. Right. So. Connective tissues are the most abundant tissue, again, by weight, so the most abundant tissue in the body. Um, its main job is to connect. I mean, again, we're gonna, there's a whole slide after this that talks about all the things it does, but the main job is it connects things. The big difference, though, and there's, a, there's several big differences, but the, the big difference between it and epithelial tissue is, in general, this tissue has a lot of filler and the cells are usually very far apart. And again, in lab, I talked about how if we imagine that this room was a, a fish tank and we had little fish, you know, like 20 fish in here and they're just kind of swimming around, the majority of this room would be water, which would end up being what we call extracellular matrix. And the little fish would be the cells. They're, very, they're usually pretty far apart, you know, and that's the way it is in these. Now, in this extracellular matrix, we have protein fibers, which we'll look at, and some things called a ground substance, which eh, we'll see if we get into that much. The protein fibers are kind of the one that we'll talk about. 
it has a varying consistency. This has, you know, blood is liquid. Blood's the only liquid. We have things like cartilage, which are kind of weird plastic-like. And then we have bone, which is very dense. So it, it's, it, it has a wide range of the way it looks. Now, in this, again, there is a range of blood supply. A bone, for instance, has really good blood supply might not seem like it, but it does. So it can heal relatively quickly. It might not, if you break a bone, it might not be quick enough for you, but it actually heals pretty quickly. Cartilage, on the other hand, does not have good blood supply. So if you damage cartilage, it's not going to heal real quickly. And as a matter of fact, it really doesn't heal well at all. And so there's a varying range of blood supply, and depending on the blood supply is how well that tissue heals. Does that make sense? Now, most cells will have the ability to divide. It's not a big deal, but there are a few in here that, that don't divide well. And they have cells that are specialized in there. And we're going to look at some of these. Uh, fixed and wandering cells, I'm not as concerned about you knowing whether it's fixed or, fixed or wandering as much as just these three types of cells. Now, the types of cells... I don't know if anyone in here, um, I'm hoping you, you've, in some of the prereqs or whatever you've had before here, um, you've studied blood a little bit. Um, if you have, there's five types of white blood cells. You're going to see two of these are related to blood, those white blood cells. The first cell we look at, however, though, called a fibroblast, is not one of those. Now, back when we were looking at certain things, I believe, talking about bone, osteocyte, osteocyte is a mature bone cell, right? The word, the prefix, or prefix, the suffix site is telling us that osteo means bone, site means mature cell, all right? So osteocyte's a mature cell. Now, osteocytes come from immature cells called osteoblasts. You kind of remember that when you're immature, life's a blast. Once you get mature, life kind of stinks, right? And so, but what an osteoblast is, it's the same cell, but when we look at bone, this is what happens. Osteoblasts create bone. Uh, bone is made up of calcium phosphate. I'm, I'm hoping that most of you know at least calcium part of it. But these cells have the ability to create calcium phosphate. Right? When they can no longer create it, they wall themselves in, they then turn into an osteoblast. If the bone breaks, or an osteocyte, if the bone breaks, they turn back to an osteoblast, create more bone, fix it, until they can no longer create bone, and then they're walled in, and they're an osteocyte. So blast means an immature cell, but it really means it's type of cell that creates its surrounding. Right? So when we talk about a fibroblast, that means it is creating fiber. It's a type of cell that's creating, we just talked about this matrix, and this is basically what it's making. Right? And we'll see, a, we'll see it again in just a little bit. Now there's another bone cell we'll look at when we get into there, but those two are kind of important for that. So fibroblasts are going to be found in connective tissue, and they create the surrounding. Right? We talked about the, if this was a fish tank, they'd be creating the little, the little treasure chest that bubbled up and the little guy that's sitting there, or whatever, you know, the stuff that's in there, right? Macrophages. Macro means big, phage means eater, big eater. This is a type of um, blood cell. It's a white blood cell, a big eater, big eater. And so this cell's job is to go around and engulf particles, whether it's a pathogen or just some kind of debris, and get rid of it. This, if you've studied white blood cells, there's a type of white blood cell called a monocyte. This is a monocyte. It is called a monocyte if it's in circulation, but monocytes tend to leave the bloodstream, go out to different organs and take up residence there. At that point, they're called a macrophage. Right? So 
far so good. Monocyte. I would know that. I'm not going to say that that's going to be huge, but it's a pretty important thing to kind of know. Mass. I'm sorry. Big eater. Eater. I'm, 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 eater. Phago, you remember, we just got, you know, the, remember the cell, the, the phagocytosis is bringing something in. Exocytosis is, uh, you know, the, our pinocytosis is water. Phagocytosis is solid. So this is a big eater. Yes. Yep. Now the other one, the last one is called a mast cell. A mast cell, again, if you've studied, if you and you don't have to know this one, but if you've studied white blood cells, there's, there's a white blood cell called a basophil. This is basically a basophil. Now, again, you don't have to know that one, but it has two chemicals in it. I want you to know a little bit about these, all right? and I'm hoping you've heard of them. I'm sure everybody's heard of this one, histamine. All right? You definitely heard of antihistamine, I'm sure. Histamine is an inflammatory chemical, and this is actually a good thing. Explain what's going to go on in just a second when I combine it with the next one. If you've ever heard of heparin, you've probably heard of it called an anticoagulant. Or no, you've probably heard it called a blood thinner. Sorry. Blood thinner is what the real world out there calls them. You know, now that you're not in the real world much anymore, you should probably learn that they're an anticoagulant, which is just means it's stopping your blood clot. So let's say I have a, um, a splinter. It comes in, it breaks the skin, it's going to bring bacteria and different pathogens in here. These cells come around it and they drop off their granules. It's going to cause vasodilation of the capillary beds, which brings more blood to the area, which means more white blood cells, which means better defense. And then it's going to drop heparin off so that as it's increasing the blood flow, it doesn't clot before it gets to the point where it's supposed to clot. Does that make sense? It would be kind of like the equivalent if an ambulance driver had the ability to make the, make the road go from a two-lane highway to an eight-lane highway to allow the EMTs to get in there and then cause all the people that are stupid and get in front of them to get pushed out of the way without causing a clog up, right? Um, so histamine and heparin, does that make sense? Heparin comes in, allows for more blood to get in the area. So if you've ever had a splinter, you'll see that there's a little red dot, basically. A little red, it's not like your whole arm swells up, hopefully. But you'll have a little swollen dot where it is. And that's because of the mast cells. All right. So far, so good. All right. I'm sorry? Yep, it's because of the chemicals. It's because the mast cells come in and drop these chemicals, cause it to bring more blood to the area. All right, so fibroblasts create the fibers that we're going to look at in just a minute. Macrophages are going through and defending us against anything that's trying to get in. They're big eaters. They engulf particles. Uh, they're, again, defends against infection. Um, if you, like, if you got a splinter and you get it infected, it'll get white and you'll get pus. That's all dead macrophages that were doing their job. Okay, so anyway, and mast cells cause a little bit of inflammation and uh, can prevent blood clots. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. And it, it's going to get real painful before it does that. Yeah. yeah. But once it gets better, it's one of those that's like, oh, my gosh, that hurts. Oh, on her heel? Oh, uh, that's a bad place, too. Um. So the fibers we were talking about. Now, I don't know why they list them like this. If I was writing this book, and you'll hear me say that a lot, if I was writing this book, reticular fibers would be the second one, and you'll see why. So these are three um, types of fibers that these fibroblasts produce. The first one are called collagen fibers. They are the main structural component of the body. Everybody heard of collagen before? Right. Collagen is super important. Now, collagen fibers, and this is weird, because collagen fibers, and you're going to think I'm joking here right now, but collagen fibers are big bundles of threads of protein called collagen. All right. 
And so it's bundles of them. I don't know if anyone here has ever had the pleasure of having to pour concrete, um, but if you do, generally they'll put down these metal bars called rebar, little iron bars to kind of strengthen the concrete. This is your body's rebar, collagen fibers. Now, reticular fibers are also made up of a protein, collagen, but these are thin. It's like a webbing of it. This is not meant to give a lot of strength. It does give a little bit. It's more of a net type stuff. You don't have to know this, but this is found mainly in the, the liver or the spleen. We looked at, you know, the collagen connective tissue. Right? Yeah. <laughs> the, brown, the brown tree bark. And again, you don't have to know where it is, but that's basically what it's doing. It's this little, it's using collagen protein, but it's not bundling it together like a big structural bar. It's making it into like a little net to filter things. So far, so good. And then we have the one that I'm hoping everybody can figure out, elastic fibers. Now, they have a protein called elastin, and these fibers are meant to stretch and come back. So we have collagen fibers and reticular fibers, both made up of collagen protein. But the collagen fibers are made up of big bundles of the collagen protein, where reticular fibers are a much finer, thinner webbing type network. And then we have reticular fibers um, that are all about stretching and coming back. Now, if you have a, a scar, what happens is the fibroblasts that come in to help, generally, if it's done right, if you don't have a scar, it's fibroblasts from that area. If, you if you're prone to scars, but even if you have a bad some cut or whatever and it scars, what's happened is fibroblasts from areas a little bit away from there come and help, and they don't produce the elastic fibers, they just produce collagen. You'll notice that no scar has good elastic ability. Scars are very rigid, and it's because the fibroblasts don't produce the elastic fibers just produce collagen. So anyway. Now, when we look at some of these different um, connective tissues, don't get, don't get worried about too much stuff on it again. It's going to be mainly um, the same as um, the same as the, the lab. You know, some of the things we'll talk about, like areolar here in just a second, we'll, um, I'll, if I ask a question about it, I probably will in the description say, when we looked at this in lab, it had hair fiber. It looked like it had hair fibers. You know, things that I would point out in the tissues in lab, I'll probably throw in little hints on the questions for this too. Now, I'm not worried about loose and dense connective tissue, but you know, the big thing is loose connective tissue. It's going to have just a little bit of collagen fiber. This is going to have a bunch. This is going to be very strong. This is meant to be not as strong. Okay. Now, um, I'm not worried about that, though. In here, if I ask questions about connective tissue for the ones I didn't ask for locations in lab, it will be simple. Areolar, if I ask anything about it, it will have in its main thing when we see it in lab, this is the one tissue that looks like it has hair fibers on it. Okay. Now, this is in the subcutaneous layer. It's in a lot of different places. It is mainly for um, separation on things. It is not, uh, not super strong. Um, it is basically these little delicate membranes that, sur that, that uh, separate like muscles and stuff from other muscles. A lot of times it can be called fascia in ways. Um, adipose tissue, in case you did not know, adipose tissue is fat. All right. it, is, um, it is found, unfortunately, all over the body um, in one way, shape, or the other. Um, but basically, adipose tissue is fat. Reticular connective tissue, again, this one... 
is going to have a lot of reticular fibers. We said that it is in areas that are going to be filtering, like liver or spleen. Again, if I ask something on this, I'm going to talk about how it is. it has an appearance of brown tree bark. Our tissue slides have the appearance of brown tree bark. Dense regular connective tissue is the one connective tissue where we first look at a location. I do want you to know dense regular connective tissue is the tissue of tendons and ligaments. <laughs> Remember that the name describes the look which describes the purpose. Densely packed regularly aligned fibers. Tendons and ligaments have to be strong in one direction. Now, you're going to see another one here that we are not, I'm not going to ask you about, but I'm going to explain anyway. Dense irregular connective tissue. So if I've got a tendon, if I've got something and I put all of the, the fibers running in one direction, that means it's, it is 100% as strong as it can be in this direction, and it is 0% any other way. I've lined them up to make sure that they're strong, the strongest possible, in one direction. Does that make sense? If I want a tissue that is strong in all directions, what I do is the fibers go in all directions. It is not, it is not super strong in any one direction, but it's as strong as it possibly can be in any direction. Does that make sense? That is dense irregular connective tissue. It's in areas that aren't going to be pulled just, it's not going to be like, it's only going to be here. It's going to be things that are going to stretch in different areas in different ways, so it needs to be as strong as it can all over. So the fibers are randomly organized, so we call it dense irregular. Is ACL dense oh, the ACL is definitely dense regular. Unfortunately, not always dense enough. Okay. Yeah, good times. Times replaced or just repaired, they just repair. I got two dead dead people's ACLs. Good times. Oh yeah, good stuff. So yeah, I feel your pain. Elastic connective tissue. Now, this again, we did not have a slide for this, but if I asked anything about elastic connective tissue, it would probably be what's the main type of fiber found in elastic connective tissue? Anybody make a guess? Yep, there we go. All right. Then we get to things like cartilage, bone, and blood, the specialized ones. Now, in cartilage, what I want you to know is, first of all, cartilage cells are called chondrocytes. Chondro means cartilage. We're not going to look at it in here, but the cell that makes cartilage is called a chondroblast. But we don't look at that. Chondrocytes. Now, since we did not get into uh, the skeletal system in lab, you don't know about these, these little lacuna. Now, we're going to look at this on Thursday when we get into the, the bones in lab. But what happens is just, and this is the same word that they use in the bone, these cells live in this really dense, packed matrix. And so they live in a little bubble in this cartilage. The bubble itself is called a lacuna. It's kind of like a cocoon. I think it actually means crib. And so um, chondrocytes live in lacuna. Now, it has little to no blood supply, so it is not going to heal. If it does heal, it's not going to heal real well. Did you tear any of your cartilage in your knees? Any knee with it? No. Don't want to. No. Yeah. If someone tell if you did and someone tells you they can heal it, don't listen to them. They're lying. Oh yeah, kind of. Yeah. Oh, that's a nasty. Yeah. Yeah. That's a that's an interesting look too. Oh yeah. Cauliflower ear. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, and yeah, like you say, it's a. Mm. Now, 
cartilage, again, three types of cartilage. Highland cartilage, what I want you to know in here, highland cartilage is the most common type of cartilage. It is um, the cartilage that your skeleton starts off as. Elastic cartilage, this is going to be the cartilage of the ear. It's like we talked about in lab. Fibrocartilage is going to be the cartilage of the vertebrae. Right? This is fibrocartilage is the one that has that blue and red appearance, right? The you know, sunset on the really blue ocean. Right? Like we said this was kind of pink, like pink and smooth, and we said if it was going to be, I'm going to have something all over my body, I want it nice and soft and like velvety looking, you know, whatever. Elastic cartilage looks rough. And we talked about Iron Mike Tyson, and he's crazy. Oh, gosh, I'm recording this. If you hear this, Mr. Tyson, I, uh, I'm sorry, don't, don't hurt me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then fibrocartilage, we said, was had a different look. It looked like the blue and red ocean. Now, I, you know, that would probably be in there, but this should be, I think people usually do well on the cartilage part. Okay. Most common type, ear, vertebrae. Ear and then the vertebrae, intervertebral discs. Now, bone, bone is, yep, it has the, like, tree ring look to it. And, again, when we get into lab tomorrow, or tomorrow, Thursday, um, we'll see this, kind of look at some of the parts of it. Um, it stores and releases calcium and phosphate, mainly calcium. We'll, again, when we get into the skeletal system in, um, in lecture, we're going to really get into that. Um, one of the things to remember is Bone is where our uh, red blood cells, the stem cells that make blood, are found there. Um, and again, we're going to get into this uh, on Thursday. Um, this is where blood cells are made. It has a stem, the stem cell. Um, the main type of cell is called an osteocyte, like we just said. And osteocytes live in little hollow openings called lacuna, just like the chondrocytes in cartilage. Right. Now, again, we're going to get into a lot of this um, on Thursday when we look at the microscopic bone structure. There's two types of bone, compact and spongy. Compact just simply is saying that compact bone is very densely packed. Spongy bone is spongy. Now, on this, I'm not worried about, I'll tell you, I'm not worried about this right now. Um, this is going to be more skeletal system. We go over this. Again, we're going to go over it in lab. Uh, but this is definitely more um, dealing in the skeletal system. Blood, on blood, I would know that it is a liquid. Blood is the only liquid connective tissue. Um, the, the matrix is called plasma, that is the liquid portion of it. In it, there's three types of uh, cells. They're called formed elements. I'm not going to ask you about that in here. When you get into 211, the first chapter you get into is blood, and you'll talk about these. Formed elements are referring to the cells in there. You should know that there are three types of cells, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. At this point, these terms are fine. When you get into 211, you'll need to know the scientific name for them. Erythrocytes, leukocytes, and thrombocytes. And here, red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets. Which I'm also good. I'm not going too fast, man. I don't know. Is everybody all right? Okay. All right. <laughs> Please do. I don't want to. Now, this... And, and, and I don't care if this is on camera. This just is, this frustrates me so much. Epithelial membranes. How many does it say there are? Three, right? So let's count them together. So this is one. This is two. This is three. Where 
does that come from? Why would they even put that there? Why would they put it there and say, oh, well, it's different? Why even bring that up? Why? All right. That is not an epithelial membrane. I don't know why they put it on there. Now, there are three epithelial membranes. We looked at one right off the bat. First lab, first lecture, we talked about visceral and parietal membranes, serous membranes. That's the first one. The second one and the third one are basically the same. The sec or I, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to this third one first, the cutaneous membrane. Right? So we looked at this in the integumentary system. The cutaneous membrane is the epidermis and dermis. It makes up what we commonly call the skin. Right? Now, wherever the skin, this cutaneous membrane, enters into our body, our mouth, our nose, and various other places, right? it turns into a mucous membrane. The cutaneous membrane in the areas that open into the body turn into a mucous membrane. They have a lot of goblet cells in the area. There's going to be a lot of fluid. It's going to be a moist area. So we've got serous membranes around our organs. We have a cutaneous membrane around our body. And then mucous membranes are the extension of the cutaneous membrane going into our body. Does that make sense? This one that they put in for whatever reason, this is, we look at these when we get into the joints, the articulations. They are not an epithelial Membrane. These are not the droids you're looking for. All right. Again, have no idea why they did that. Now, we're going to get into muscular tissue and nervous tissue. Just like we talked about in lab, these have their own lectures. I just want you to know the basics of them. For muscles, muscles first, I hope everybody knows their whole point is they're going to shorten or contract with force. No matter what they are, their job is to change shape and pull. Now, just a little FYI, muscles can only pull, they cannot push. Right? That will help you when we start looking at certain things. In, in, two, in 211, when you look at the muscles or respiration, if you can understand that muscles... They can't push. If I was a muscle, I could not get out of this room, right, because the door opens out. I can only pull. I can't push. Right? Now, ask, yes? Can you say an example of a muscle that can push? Like where they start to push, like where it's just like more of a relaxed position and they start to push? The hyperextension, like where it just... No, like where you can hold bones and then it just becomes like a more relaxed position. I don't know. I don't know that. <laughs> well, I got rid of cable a long time ago, so I might be, you know, I found that it was just, it was a black hole of time for me. I would just sit there and then. Well, you have that going for you. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> the, um, so to look at this, what I want you to know about this, there are three types of muscle. Skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle. I want you to know skeletal muscle is the only voluntary muscle. Cardiac and smooth are involuntary. You'll see basically that skeletal muscle is pretty much the only thing you have conscious control of. Everything else, your body is running underneath your level of consciousness, which is good. I don't want to have to concentrate on beating my heart and, um, you know, producing digestive enzymes and peristalsis. Body do it. Right? So skeletal muscle is voluntary. The other two are involuntary. Skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle are called striated because they have a striped or striated appearance. Smooth muscle is called smooth muscle because it doesn't have that. The last thing that I want you to know 
is that cardiac muscle has these intercalated discs. And at this point now, I want you to be able to tie it into the fact that what these intercalated discs are, these darkened stripes, this is where the desmosomes and the gap junctions are. It's designed for a really strong bond between those muscle fibers so that when the heart contracts, it doesn't rip itself apart, which would not be good. Uh, yep, the intercalated discs, and they're only found in the, in the cardiac muscle. All right. So which ones are voluntary, involuntary? Which ones are striped or not striped? And then the cardiac muscle has intercalated. And I mean, I hope you know that cardiac muscle is found only in the heart. All right. All right. So, okay. When we look at the nervous system, the neurons are the, the star of the show. Neurons are for communication. They're, pro in my opinion, they are the most amazing cell in the body. Although there's plenty of them that they could try to, you know, try to take that title. But neurons are what control everything. The way they do it is there are two types of appendages. I'll call them from the cell body. So we've got a cell body, and we've got things coming and going. Dendrites bring information into the cell body, and you can have one or you can have many dendrites. The neurons in your brain, for instance, on average are going to have over about 10,000 dendrites, all bringing information into one little cell. But no matter how many dendrites it has, there is always only one axon, and the axon is what takes the information away from the cell. That axon might branch a million times, but it's only one that comes from the cell. Right? Dendrites bring information in, axon takes it away. I'm not worried about neuroglial cells right now. We'll look at this in the nervous system chapter. Neuroglial cells are just cells that are there to support um, and cheer. They're like little cheerleaders. Yay! Go, neuron, go. Yes. Yes. Yep. That was an easy question. You actually answered it. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> now that's chapter five. Again, most of it, if you went and watched just the lab video for chapter five, you're going to get 80% of what we went over. Probably. I mean, I didn't do a, you know, a cost analysis of it, but it was pretty close. Right. Now we're going to go into Chapter 6, and you're going to see it's basically the same thing. There's going to be, there might be a few things and a few more things in Chapter 6 that you might, that might be new, but a lot of it I think you might know anyway. The one thing I'll say is this starts off with the grossest picture. I don't understand why they would do that. You can, pick, you can have all kinds of pictures. That's your skin. That's hair coming out of it. It's like, why? <laughs> yeah. Like, no. That's just, why? 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 So, chapter six is our first system, right? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Shouldn't even have brought it up, but it did bother me. Um, so, the integumentary system, like I said, is our first system we look at. And... In it, we have the skin. Remember, the skin is called the cutaneous membrane, and it is made up of the epidermis and dermis, the outer layer and the middle layer. We have an innermost layer that's called the hypodermis or subcutaneous. Same, you know, the same terminology, or same thing, structure, just two different ways to talk about. So the cutaneous membrane is called the skin. It's the two outer layers of this. And in this, we have basically stratified squamous epithelium makes up the epidermis. The majority of the dermis is made up of dense irregular tissue. There is elastic tissue in here as well, but I'm not worried about that. 
I do want you to know, obviously, this is the stratified squamous because this is the what we looked at in lab. And I want you to know that the subcutaneous slash hypodermis is almost entirely adipose tissue. There's other stuff in it. There's some areolar and whatever, but it is mainly adipose tissue. Not worried about this middle one because there's more than just this, but that definitely need to know. And there's not a lot we're going to talk about the hypodermis. The main thing is it's adipose tissue. Now, the epidermis, here are some new things to it. First of all, how many people have heard of the protein called keratin? Right. Keratin is a really important thing for your skin, your hair, and your nails. And you're going to see that basically your skin, your hair, and your nails are kind of the same in a lot of ways. So the epidermis, the cells in the epidermis are called keratinocytes. Right? So as a classification, they are stratified squamous, but the cells themselves are referred to as keratinocytes. Right? The process of them becoming little dead flat keratin shields is called keratinization. Right. Now, when we looked at this, we said that in lab, you needed to know the innermost layer and the outermost layer. Stratum basal is the innermost layer. Stratum corneum is the outermost layer. We talked about the corns on the skin. We, that's where it came from. Stratum basal in, in science, basal means bottom. Now, we're going to see, and again, we went over this a little bit in, um, in lab about these layers of the epidermis. Now, in here, I'm not going to go over my mnemonic, but hopefully you remember it or come up with your own, right? So we have the stratum basal, the bottommost layer. One cell layer thick of cells that are just going through mitosis like crazy. As they produce daughter cells, they get pushed up, and it continues to be pushed up. The first layer, the layer that the cells are, are newly born and they're pretty much alive and think everything's great, is called stratum basal. The stratum basal, you'll see as it gets closer, as the stratum basal gets closer to the surface, these cells here will start developing more granules, and they become darker. This layer is called the stratum granulosum. It is granules of keratin. The, as the cells get older, they start producing this keratin. And when I say older, it doesn't take much time to get from here to there. Right? They're getting pushed up pretty quickly. Now, yeah, they're getting older, Grandpa. And um, so as these granules start taking over, they start killing the cell. They start killing the different organelles in the cell, and they start turning it into the flat leather shields that they will eventually become. Now, stratum basal is the bottom. Stratum spinosa is the next layer. Stratum granulosum is the next layer up. This weird one called stratum lucidium, this is only found in the palms of the hand and the soles of the feet. It's not found anywhere else. This layer here is what makes this area, my palms and the soles of my feet, considered thick skin. So if someone tells you to get thick skin, you got thick skin, put it right in their foot. No, I'm just kidding. And then the outermost layer, stratum corneum. These are the dead, flat, leather, protective cells. It's the thickest layer, um, and it's the layer that's doing the main job. So those are the five layers of the epidermis. Right. There will probably be a question where you organize those properly. Would that be all right? It's just they're they're the new they have not been granulosized yet. They haven't been attacked by the keratin. So they're alive and they think life's great and they don't realize they're getting ready to get whacked. Yep. 
So as we go through, again, this kind of gives you the characteristics of them. Um, not, not a big deal. More, more concerned about you knowing the layers of them right now. I still, the, the only two that I want you to know really, I mean, I hope stratum granulosum, if I say this, you know, if I have a question about in this layer, the granules of keratin start really becoming apparent. I hope you could name that stratum granulosum. But the two layers that I would have more questions about, if any, is stratum basal, stratum corneal. Stratum basal, bottommost layer, this is where the cells are dividing. None of the cells up here divide. Right? This is the only area where they go through mitosis. Stratum corneum, outermost layer, dead, flat cells. All right. So going back to this slide, we're good. The cells themselves are called keratinocytes because they go through a process called keratinization where keratin builds up in them, kills them, turns them into little leather shields. Now, there are some specialized cells in here. So I want you to know this one. We're not going to worry about this one. I'll, I'm going to go over it, but I'll, I'll tell you about it. I don't want it, you to get confused with the stuff we looked at in lab on this. Um, this one I do want you to know something about. Dendritic or called Langerhand cells. These are a type of, we just looked at, the macrophages, all right, macrophages, big eater, the phagocytic cell. This is a type of macrophage that's found in the epidermis. They hang out and wait. If anything gets past that outer protection where those cells are being, you know, thrown off, if they can get in, these cells come and eat them, all right? And there's, when you get into the lymphatic system and study immunity, um, you'll see some things about these. But they're a part of your immune system. They're hanging out in the epidermis, waiting to see if anything uh, breaks through that wall. This, uh, they're a type of phagos, they're a type of macrophage. Right? They're a phagocytic type cell. This, the tactile or Merkel cells. Right? So in lab, we talked about. Meisner corpuscles and packing corpuscles. Meisner corpuscles are up towards the surface. They're for light touch and pressure. They're also called tactile corpuscles. These are for even finer senses. I'm not going to ask you about this. Right? But these are a few little uh, random nerve endings that get into the epidermis. And so where the, the Meisner corpuscle are for light touch and pressure, these are for even lighter touch. Again, don't want you to get confused with the other ones. Not going to ask you about that. It's into the epidermis. So it's even above the ones we looked at. The one, the pachyon are for the heavy. Yep, yep. So if we were looking at all three of them together, this is the most superficial and for the lightest touch. Meisner corpuscles are still superficial, but they're a little bit under this because they never get out of the dermis. They're for light touch as well. Pachyon is the deepest. It would be closer to the subcutaneous level, and it's for heavy pressure. No. I would. I would. I would. Yeah. Yeah. No. This Thursday we didn't go over anything. Yeah, y'all been lucky. This cell, I definitely am going to ask you questions about. All right. Melanocytes. Melanocytes, and actually I'm going to use a different, I don't know why this book doesn't really have a good picture of these anymore. I have to use the, um, so a melanocyte. Melanocytes produce a P 
pigment for the skin called melanin. Melanin is what gives us our skin color. Now these, si these cells are really, really cool. So the way that they work is, and I should have a little bit more, kept it there. This over here is a melanocyte. Its cell body is going to be along the stratum basal. Now we just said the stratum basal is the only area where cells are dividing, right? And they're dividing quickly. Those cells, you really have to protect the genetic material because if I have some kind of mutation form on them, that ends up being something like cancer because they're going to divide really quickly and then that's going to be a problem. So I have these cells along the basement membrane monitoring radiation. They're monitoring UV, UVA, UVB, light. And if they sense that radiation is getting close to the stratum basal, they will start producing more melanin. And they, their cell looks like a big octopus. They have these long tentacles that get up into the stratum basal, almost into the stratum granulosum, and this is where they start dumping out the melanin. I think that's pretty amazing. Right? Now, all of us have roughly the same number of melanocytes. The issue is, through heredity, different genetic backgrounds will have different levels of activity of the melanocytes, naturally. If you have ancestors that were in the tropics, or even all the way up, oddly enough, at the poles, because even though it's an angled if you've ever gone snow skiing, you can get sunburned pretty badly snow skiing. Right? If your genetic family comes from those areas, you're going to have darker skin. If you came from the quote-unquote temperate zone, the one kind of in the middle, you're going to have fairer skin, whiter skin. We all have the same basic number of melanocytes. It's just that if you have ancestors that grew up and lived in an area that was very um, hot where you've got direct sunlight, those genetic traits will automatically have you producing melanin right off the bat. If you didn't grow up in those areas, you're going to have these melanocytes that aren't going to produce as much, but they're going to, you can tell, like you can tell, um, everybody gets darker if they're out in the sun. It doesn't matter how dark you are, you get darker when you're out in the sun. It shows up more if you are whiter and then you get tan, but it's still the same. Does that make sense? So heredity is the main, um, the main pusher of how it, uh, your, your natural skin color. Now, um, you can have mutation in the gene to produce melanin, and we call that uh, al to be uh, albinism. I was just, I guess you would be an albino. That's a weird, I never had, that's weird, I didn't think it was, didn't sound right, albinism. But anyway, that just means you don't make melanin, and it's more than just skin, it's your hair and your, your the, the iris of your eyes, everything, and you don't have any color for it. That I'm knowing an albino is someone that doesn't produce melanin. I don't like saying that albinism. I don't know if, if, if I'm offended. That's just weird. I've never called it that before. So anyway, but every, are we all familiar with that, at least somewhere in the terminology? Now, there are things that can change our skin color. Um, we generally understand this. Sunlight, we live at the beach. Most of us probably know sunlight can change your skin color. I hope no one in here goes to sun tanning beds. If you do, that's the whole job is to, to try and change your skin color. And unfortunately, if you're for people who are studying x-rays early on, they found out that it changes their skin color, but it also causes cancer and you know, all kinds of things because they would sit there. The, the, the poor people that discovered x-rays, I mean, they're like, oh, look at this zap. Oh, wow, zap. Hey, hey, hey. This, and, 
sudden it's like genetic issues. But anyway, environmental factors can change skin color. Again, because sunlight's going to get down, if it gets towards that stratum basal, those melanocytes will start producing melanin. It's like this built-in umbrella shade to try and protect that innermost layer. Now, there are physiological things that we can do um, that will change it. Um, the two easiest ones to, to see are cold and hot. Um, if you get really cold, and again, light-skinned people, it shows up mu much easier to see. But if you get cold, you're going to kind of turn pink. Really, the lips are the area you see it the most because the lips are redder than normal skin color because of blood being pushed to the surface. But if you're cold, your body's going to try to take that blood and pull it into your core so you're not losing heat. And because of that, the skin color will change. And it's the same if you're hot, only opposite. If you're hot, your body's going to start pushing your blood right to the surface so that the sweat mechanism can try to cool you down so you'll become red or flush. Anybody ever heard of jaundice? Yep. Jaundice, most people have heard it through babies. If you've ever had a bruise that was bad enough to turn black to green to yellow, you had a little bit of jaundice. All jaundice is is the breakdown of red blood cells. Um, if little babies will have it pretty often because their liver isn't mature enough, and so the breakdown spills out into the, into the bloodstream, and it shows up in the skin. And it is not a, it's a weird thing. It's not dangerous. It's, it, it's going to be, it's fine, but yeah, it's, but it can be very, you know, it's like if you're a, a mom or it's like, ah, my baby's yellow, right? Um, <laughs> which is kind of a weird thing. Um, this one, I got to tell a funny story about this one. Keratin. Anybody ever heard of keratin found in carrots? Oddly enough, right? Um, so when I first went to Atlanta for chiropractic school, I'm a little sheltered kid from a little town in Mississippi, and I go to Atlanta, and I realize chiropractors are weird people. And um, they, the, a lot of people juiced. Um, you know, if you've ever seen the little, looks like a little wood chipper where you put stuff in. And, and I, I still think I should do it more often, but I don't. Um, it is really one of the best ways to get vitamins and stuff. But when I first went to chiropractic school, that's what everybody was doing. And I'm like, well, that's kind of cool. And I had a glass of carrot juice. And carrot juice is really good. I don't really care for carrots, but carrot juice is actually pretty good. And so I got to where every morning I would juice like a pound of carrots and some apples and like celery and drink it. And, and then all of a sudden I realized... I'm turning orange. And I, I didn't put it together at first. And it, it accumulates first in the stratum lucidium. So all of a sudden, the palms of my hand, and I'm like, what are these crazy people over here doing to me? I, you know, I got some kind of weird you know, Willy Wonka disease. I'm, you know, you're turning violet, violet. And, and it, it kept getting worse. But every morning, I kept juicing my carrots and not thinking anything, thinking, well, this will help me because I'm thinking I'm being healthy. And then finally, someone's like, hey, you idiot. Carrots have this pigment in it that you're just putting ton, you know, not you know, a pound of carrots is a pretty big amount of carrots, um, and so I realized I'm like, oh wow, I was an idiot. I just was doing that, and I it took a while for it to get out of my system, but um, thank God that it wasn't anything crazy. Um, but this happens to parents a lot too because um, you know everybody wants their kids to eat vegetables, and one of the easiest vegetables to get kids to eat are carrots because it's sweet, and they'll eat it, and they'll, oh, hey, little, and then all of a sudden, poop, they got a little orange little baby, and it's, it'll freak them out. So it can change skin color. Um, as a sidebar, and this isn't about skin color, if you um, get out and work in, like, the ER, you'll find beets cause a lot of ER trips because beets turn everything red. And so people go to the bathroom and think they're bleeding, and they'll run, I mean, it is not an uncommon thing to have people come in thinking that they've got some kind of intestinal issue. And it's like, no, you just ate beets. Um, anyway. I'm sorry? 
a lot of cash. <laughs> I, I never thought about that, but yeah. Uh, the um, so the dermis. Now we get into the this middle layer, the dermis, um, as it says, the inner layer of the skin, but the middle layer. Now. The projections, as it says, are called dermal papilla, but the papilla refer to the, um, the capillaries, the papillary capillaries in there. Um, this is going to be where we're going to see uh, hair with hair follicles and the sebaceous gland and different things. Now, one thing we don't look at in here, there's two layers of the dermis, or don't look at in lab, there's two layers of the dermis. Um, and... If I was to draw on this one and say this area, all right, so it's kind of angled, this area is called the papillary layer, all right? The papillary layer is mainly just the area of that capillary bed that's running underneath. So the papillary layer um, is going to have the dermal papilla and whatever. It is very superficial. The reticular layer is the rest of it, right? Definitely the thickest of the two. And again, if I was drawing it, um, this area right here would be the papillary. The rest of this would be the reticulum. It's dense, it's actually loose, regular connect, but what I said when we were looking at it, it has multiple types. There is some reticular, there is some elastic. That's why I said I'm only worried about you knowing the epidermis and the subcutaneous, because it's really, there's a lot going on here. Does that make sense? And that's why I kind of said I won't ask you about it on that one. Yep. But there is reticular fibers in there, elastic fibers. Actually... Um, one of the things um, that you can see uh, how your body, one of the things about body aging is um, the elastic fibers, your body doesn't produce them as much as you get older. And if you take a little baby and you kind of pinch the skin, pull it, and not hard, but pull it, it'll snap right back. But if you have a grandparent and you do that, you pull it and it stays there, right? And it's because the uh, elastic fibers aren't there anymore. Yeah, carrot juice. No, it's all right. Now, in this, the main thing we talk about with the um, with this dermis area are the accessory structures in here: fo hair follicles, nails, and the, the sweat glands. Now, again, if we were going to really dig and tear this apart we would see that most of these accessory structures actually start in the epidermis. All right? When we look at the hair follicle, I told you there, the, the dividing line between the hair shaft and the hair root was the basement membrane. If you look at a picture close enough, you will see that the whole hair follicle is part of the basement membrane. Okay. That's not what I'm worried about. Understand it's in the dermis. Okay. So as we're going in, I mean, if you if you get into um, into any of the schools about uh, dermatology or whatever, you know, you'll get into it a lot more, and you'll see things, and you go, ah, my professor was lying to me or whatever. Um, but I'm really not. But uh, yes, I just want to get you through the course. Now this is really um, in depth here. So nails. Um, three parts. This is not a math book. <laughs> right? So the three parts are the nail plate, which is the body of the nail. And this is basically um, what we would consider the nail, whether it's fingernail, toenail, whatever. Um, underneath the nail plate, the skin that's underneath it is called the nail bed. Right. 
Now, the nail matrix and the and the lunula. I always have a problem with that. Lunula, lunula. These two are kind of the same. Okay. The nail pre the nail matrix is actually the um, would be the equivalent of the stratum basal for the epidermis. This is where the the cells are growing really fast and they're pushing them forward. Now in the epidermis, there's a process. You know, we go through the stratum spinosum, gran granulosum, and then finally up. In this, pretty much right off the bat, boom, they're killed and turn into little keratin um, things, right? Now, the nail matrix and the lanula um, are basically one and the same. This is just the area that you can see that kind of um, is over it. It's what looks, the reason it's called lanula, it has a, the root is a lunar, basically. It looks like that little white part that looks like a little bit of a moon um, at it. That is what it is. All right. So, and finally, the cuticle is uh, the part of the, the stratum corneum. Actually, it's part of the epidermis that, that um, extends over the nail. Now, the nail plate is the nail. The nail bed is the skin underneath it. The nail plate is being created by the nail matrix in the area that we call the lanula. So far, so good. Did I confuse everybody there with that? Am I all right? Exciting? I'm sorry. All right, so this is trying to show the picture of it, right? So this little part that's way down deep is where it's growing. Um, the lanula is just the visible part of the matrix that's coming out. This is the nail plate, nail beds, the skin underneath it, um, and the cuticle. So, all right, not a lot of questions that are going to come from that, not a lot of things that are you know, going to be in there. Um, so the hair, we said that the hair root is the part that is in the dermis. The hair shaft is what extends out of the dermis. The hair shaft is dead cells. Um, the hair root is going to be surrounded by what's called a hair follicle. Right? Again, just like what we talked about in lab. The one thing we didn't talk about in lab, and we talked about the hair papilla that goes up, in the hair root, the very bottom part of it is called the hair bulb. This is the matrix that we looked at in the nail. This is the stratum basal that we looked at at the epidermis. This is the part where the cells are growing, are dividing, and, and producing new cells. So it's the very bottom of the root. Yeah. So let me see if there's a pictures make it easier. So basically, and this is what I was talking about, how the basement membrane kind of extends down. Right, so if I drew a line here, this below the basement membrane, this is called the hair root. This part that extends above is called the hair shaft. The hair root is going to have all kinds of structures with it, the follicle and stuff. The hair shaft is basically just the hair. It's just the tube that extends out. Yeah, did that make yeah, yeah. pictures make it so much easier? <clears throat> so when we look at this, again, the hair root is surrounded by the hair follicle. It is a depression of epiderm epidermal cells. I'm not worried about that. It is in the dermis and it is around the hair root. Right? <clears throat> At the base of the hair root is the hair bulb, which again is the equivalent of the stratum basal or that area called the matrix. You know, it's the area of growth. Right? Now, we have a specialized hair 
capillary, a little finger-like capillary coming to the hair bulb, and it is called the hair papilla. That's what we looked at in lab. Okay. Now, every hair is going to have this little thing called a sebaceous gland. It's usually associated with hair follicles. I'm not following that, but anyway, as the hair follicle gets closer to the, the surface, right before that hair root is getting ready to leave the protection of the hair follicle, there's a sebaceous gland. Sebaceous gland produce something called sebum. All right? It is, sebum is a waterproofing oil. It has antifungal, antibacterial, anti viral properties that help protect it. And this is what causes acne. All right? True acne is a problem with these sebaceous glands. Now, it, they are going to be found anywhere except palms of the hands, soles of the feet, because, again, there's no hair there. Um, these are holocrine glands. Now, remember, we talked about holocrine glands just a minute ago. That means when they release their substance, the whole cell ruptures when it releases sebum. So it's not just sebum. Part of it is going to be the actual cell that's producing it as well. Right. Make sense? Now we get to sweat glands. So in lab, we had that model, and we said there's only one sweat gland in there. And so worried about you naming it a sweat gland. Now, this is when we see the difference between the sweat glands. Now, the first type of sweat gland is called an ecrine or sometimes called mercrine. Now, it's called this because that's what it is as far as the type. It merely secrete, secretes a fluid. Okay. This is the main sweat gland of our body. This is the type of sweat gland that is responding to body temperature. It is active, doesn't say this here, but these are active throughout your life. From when you're a little baby to when you're old. These are, they're all, and, and they're doing their job. They try to help regulate body temperature. The sweat that they produce is mainly water. It's going to have some electrolytes and stuff in it, some little, but it's mainly water. It is not really smelly. Okay. This one, on the other hand, the next one is called an apocrine sweat gland. Remember, a part of the gland is released with apocrine. And when apocrine glands, they are the ones that become active during puberty. These are going to be associated always with hair, where Ecrine or miracrine sweat glands, you know, they got the little ball here and it goes up. This duct goes right to the surface to drop off the water. An apocrine sweat gland, what's going to happen is if I had a little hair follicle here, a little hair shaft, sebaceous gland, if I, if I was a apocrine gland, its duct would open up onto the hair. That's why these are located in axillary and groin areas, same areas where hair start to develop during puberty. These are emotional, and definitely in puberty. It's weird because it's, I think it's supposed to be in the grand scheme of things to be attractive. <laughs> you know, as a, yeah. To an ape, right? Apocrine. They make you smell like an ape. Um, so those are the two types of sweat glands. Again, the big difference is, in the grand scheme of things, if you're looking to tell the difference in a picture, this, the, the duct goes out to the surface of the skin, apocrine, it always goes to a hair follicle. Ecrine or miracrine sweat glands are active throughout life. They are for regulating body temperature. Apocrine sweat glands become active at puberty. 
They're only found in the axillary and groin areas, and they respond to emotions. So far, so good. And then finally, there are two sets of specialized sweat glands, and this kind of sounds weird. One of them, ceramiphysis, ceramiphysis, that word. Yeah, this is a specialized sweat gland in the ear that produces earwax. Yeah. And then, oddly enough, mammary glands are a type of sweat glands. And obviously, they produce milk. All right. Serum minus. Yeah, once I mess it up, I'll never get it. So here's the picture that kind of shows the difference between the two, if you were going to see it. Uh, you know, this goes up to the surface. Uh, this was the apocrine because it goes right with the, um, the hair follicle. In general, and again, this is not going to be a question for me, uh, apocrine sweat glands are usually more associated with the lower part right at the border between the, um, the subcutaneous level and the dermis. Uh, Muricrine are usually a little higher up. Um, but again, not something I'm going to ask. One's for temperature regulation, miracrine, ecrine. One is emotional, becomes active during puberty. That is apocrine. So far, so good. Yeah. yeah. And it really does, too. Mm -hmm. Now, the skin is, again, it is the barrier. Uh, when you get into, again, and to study, the, um, uh, to study immunity, the skin is referred to as the first line of defense because anything that's going to attack you has to get over this barrier first. So it is a very protective barrier. Um, it has sensory receptors in it for all kinds of different things, very light touch as well. Some waste can be excreted here, but it is very rare. Um, you will, if you're in the healthcare field, you will probably come across some people that will have kidney issues, and because their body can't get rid of waste products through urination, they'll start sweating it out tell because they'll sweat and their sweat will smell like urine um, but that's a problem if it that if that's the main way to get rid of something um, vitamin D um, is really uh, really a big thing is you know sunlight um, sunlight is very strange because you don't want to do too much of it and you don't want to get just crazy with it rub yourself with baby oil and sit on a, a roof or something uh, but you do need sunlight do need that it's the it's what makes vitamin D. Vitamin D helps with calcium absorption and along with other things that we'll look at later. And of course, regulation of body temperature. And we talked about this not just with the sweat glands, but just talking about how it changes skin color. If I'm cold, my body's going to take my blood and pull it in. If I'm hot, it's going to push it out to the surface. And all of this is about the skin. Now, our body temperature needs to stay fairly close to 98.6. Right? Um, and if it gets out of alignment with that, it can cause all kinds of problems um, in, you know, in certain areas. Now, again, um, heat is released through metabolism. Just chemical reactions. All of the chemical reactions we have in our body, most of them, uh, the, major and the majority of the, the energy transfer is released as heat. Um, and so the skin is going to play a big role for this. Now, we're constantly losing heat. Um, I'm not, I'm going to explain some of this. This is not going to be a big part of the test. This gets into more physics stuff. First of all, I, this will be, this part, evaporation, all right? I want you to understand that the reason we sweat is because when the sweat evaporates, it's going to pull the heat from 
the blood and use that as the energy to go from a liquid to a gas. Anytime we change phases, it requires an energy source, and it, that's how it cools the body. It pulls the heat out of the blood. Now, evaporation happens best when we're going from you know, our skin to an area of dry air because the air can absorb more water. But here in the wonderful southeast, we have something called humidity, which most of the air is saturated already, so the sweat doesn't evaporate well. Right? Now, convection is going gonna, is gonna to be about like um, a fan. You know, if you sit in front of a fan, it's going to feel cooler because the air as it blows past you is going to cause the heat to be lost. If you, um, if you have something frozen and you want to thaw it out, you know, you don't just leave it on the counter and you don't just put it in hot water. If you just run cold water over it, what happens is the water continues to pull the heat off of it by convection. It's the same thing that the air does as it's going by you. Right? Conduction is how if I touch this, this is cold, my hand is hot, it's going to pull the, the heat from my hand to this. Um, it always moves from hot to cold. That's energy transfer. Again, not a big deal, but that's called conduction. And radiation is just simply that I'm going to have the heat radiate from my skin out to the surface. It's kind of like conduction. It's just that we're talking about with um, the air. It's just moving out towards from hot to cold. All right? Now, of these, that's the one I want you to know a little bit about. Does that make sense? Because this ties in with sweat glands, this ties in with the whole homeostasis that we looked at before, and so all good. All right. Now we talked about this before. Um, this is one of the, probably the third time we've looked at temperature regulation. We looked at it in homeostasis, negative feedback, all right? So if I become hot, I'm gonna start having areas, well, one thing I want you to know now briefly talked about it before, but inside my brain, there's an area called the hypothalamus. That is where my thermostat is. And so if I go outside, and it's kind of, it's been cooler lately, but let's say, you know, we're talking about back in June. I go outside, it's really hot. My thermal receptors, my little receptors in my skin that are monitoring the temperature will notice that things are getting hot and it's going to do something to try and bring it back down to normal. And what's going to happen is vasodilation of the blood vessels in the surface of the skin. My body's pushing the blood there. That's why we were talking about it changes my skin color. Then we're going to have my sweat glands start producing that watery fluid. These are the sweat glands that are controlling body temperature. The watery fluid, when it evaporates, pulls the heat off of the, the uh, blood, and that cools me down. If, on the other hand, you know, I decide to go up to Canada in the, um, in the winter, and I'll go out there, and obviously I'll be cold. My little thermal receptors are going to go back to that same area, the hypothalamus. It's going to say, all right, got to do something to raise my, my body temperature. I'm getting cold. One of the first things it's going to do is now it's the opposite. Vasoconstrict those dermal blood, blood capillaries pulling the blood away from the surface so that I don't lose it to radiation, you know. Um, now, as that happens, the sweat glands are going to be inactive, but I'm going to start sending signals to muscles to call, cause them to contract a little bit. We call it shivering. And again, because in any energy transfer, which that's what a muscle contraction is, over half of the energy is released as heat, so it's trying to warm you up, right? Yay. Now, hyperthermia and hypothermia. Hyperthermia is when we get too hot. Hypothermia is when we get too cold. Now, here in the, in the southeast, this is a real issue to be careful of. Um, because uh, our, the, the sweat mechanism doesn't work real well, we can have real serious things like heat stroke and, um, and cause problems. And, and the odd thing is, what happens is the skin, one of the first signs is the person will become kind of dizzy and nauseous, and then their skin will turn dry. It's basically your body's like, the sweat isn't working anymore, and 
it just shuts it off. And so your skin goes from being, you're sweating a lot, to all of a sudden it just shuts it off. And that's a bad sign, right? Um, the pulse will start becoming rapid. We call it thready. It'll be kind of rapid and kind of weak. Um, and again, this is a really dangerous thing. And, it, and here it can happen really quick if you're outside in the summer. Now, just as an FYI, if you ever are moving somewhere like Arizona where it's a dry heat, they have another type of problem because evaporation works so well, they can be dehydrated quickly because they don't realize that they're sweating so much and losing so much fluid, they can have other issues because of that. But in here, right now, all I want you to know, hyperthermia means I'm too hot. Hyper is too, too hot. Yep. Hypothermia is when I get too cold. Now you'll start shivering and there'll be contraction. And this is kind of weird in the fact that um, I don't want it to sound like it's a good thing, but your reflexes start slowing down. I don't know if you've ever been cold where, you, you know, all of a sudden you can't, your hands just don't want to move real quick. Um, it's like things slow down. And it actually will cause you to go to sleep. You'll just kind of slow down to the point where you end up going to sleep and dying, but um, which is not good. Yeah. But um, hopefully we don't have to experience any of that. But hypothermia is too cold. Hyperthermia is too hot. Inflammation. Now, this is a little different. Um, in the way, if we're thinking about this is normal, don't think of this as edema. If, you, if you're familiar with edema, that's abnormal swelling. Swelling's normal, right? Swelling, like we were talking about with the mast cell coming in, releasing the you know, histamine and heparin. Um, swelling is normal. And, and it can be, it's usually good. You know, obviously, it can get to a point of bad, but... It's your body's trying to, to restrict the infection. It's trying to put pressure in it, keep it walled off. Now, the signs of inflammation. Now, remember, what color is blood? Obviously, if I'm putting fluid into an, more fluid into an area, it's going to swell. Blood is warmer than normal tissue, so it'll be warm. And it's obviously not going to feel good. The four signs of inflammation. Redness, swelling, inflammation, warm, painful. Duh. Right? That, you know, that, that should just go without saying. Now, cuts. This again, there, there's so much more than this, but this breaks it down to shallow cuts and deep cuts. Shallow cuts are shallow, deep cuts are deep. Shallow cuts are cuts that do not get through the epidermis. Now, these we would kind of call a scratch. If it makes it through the dermis, now it's a deep cut. Now, there are different, there's, there's so much more to this, but that's what I want you to know right now. Shallow cuts don't make it through the epidermis, deep cuts do. In a deep cut, obviously there will be blood because now once we get into that upper part of the dermis, that, that papillary area, we're going to get into the capillary area, so blood vessels will break, so we're going to have you know, bleeding. I am not going to go through the process of clots and how they uh, how they work because this is you'll get into it in um, the chapter in blood and it's a complicated process but a clot is going to form and dry into what we call a scab in a deep cut now in this fibroblasts come in and they will start producing collagen fibers to help wall this off. If it's in an area where the fibroblasts are normally found, this will produce more elastic fibers, and you 
won't have as much of a scar. Growth factors. This is, a, this is an enzyme, basically. What do you think growth factors do? Cause things to grow. And so if I've got a cut, growth factors are released so that the cells along the cut edge start dividing and fill in the gap. Phagocytes come in to get rid of any of the, the, the anything that's come in, any pathogen, and any of the dead stuff. Again, part of this is going to be because a mast cell is going to release that, and we're going to produce more blood into the organ. If excess collagen uh, is produced, it's called a scar. Now, most of that, I am hoping, is not something you have to go home and study to know. A clot forms a scab. Growth factors are released to cause things to grow. Fibroblasts that we looked at just a minute ago produce fibers, mainly collagen. And it repairs. Deep means it's below the epi it gets past the epidermis into the dermis. If it gets into the hypodermis, if you know, and hopefully no one has ever had this happen or seen it, but a cut that gets into the hypodermis, because the hypodermis is generally adipose tissue, that cut will have, you'll see the yellow fat in it, and that means you've gotten in pretty deep. <coughs> Excuse me. Now burns, we get into a little bit more, um, you know, again, superficial and, uh, and deep cuts I'm hoping are pretty straightforward. Burns, At least they don't say that there's four in there because there's only three. Um, now, most of us know burns by first, second, and third degree. Now, I want you to know them by the more scientific name, which is these. Now, there are three burns, first degree, second degree, third degree, right? And we all know that's in, le that's in order of the, the least burn to the greatest burn, first, second, and third. Now, First and second degree burns are what are referred to as partial thickness burns. So if I'm putting these in order, if I have these names and you don't know what's first, second, and third, look at these. Superficial partial thickness, deep partial thickness, and third degree is called full thickness. So if I had these three terms, right, full thickness, superficial partial thickness, and deep partial thickness. I would hope you'd be able to organize those, right? Obviously, the full thickness is going to be more intense than partial thickness. So if I'm looking at the three, full thickness is obviously the, the big one. Then if I've got the two partial thickness, obviously superficial is more superficial than deep, right? Does that make sense? Don't overthink this. I mean, the, the names, I get people that miss this a lot on, on the test, and it, I can't figure it out. Full thickness means the whole thing's burned. If it's partial thickness, that means the whole thing's not burned, only partial. And then if I take the partial thickness and say between superficial and deep, that means superficial is just a little part. Deep means a lot more. So superficial partial thickness is first degree burns. This is a burn that's only burning the epidermis. It doesn't get into the upper layer of the dermis. Now, when it says as in a sunburn, this is not kind of the sunburns that we think of, like I fell asleep on the beach, or you see the people that come down from Ohio, and then they go lay on the beach the first day, right in the middle of June, and you're like, wow. Right? That's a different type of sunburn. This is the type of sunburn as I'm driving and I got my arm on the window and, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's red. Does that make sense? Different type of sunburn. This is not going to blister in general. It will be red. It will be hot. It will be irritated. Um, you know, it's going to take a few days to go away, uh, to go completely away. It will probably take a week or so. No scarring. Superficial partial thickness means it doesn't get past. Now, when we're talking, the thickness, by the way, I didn't say this. The thickness is the cutaneous membrane. All right, so the thickness is the cutaneous membrane. So 
Superficial partial thickness is the epidermis, the most superficial part of the cutaneous membrane. Deep partial thickness will get into that upper layer of the dermis. Now, the upper layer of the dermis that we call the papillary layer is where we have the capillary bed right underneath there. So if I burn into this, now I'm going to have blisters because now I'm going to start messing with the capillaries. I'm going to start messing with the blood flow. So in generally, it says it may blister. It's, it's generally going to blister. Um, bless you. Depending on how deep it gets, it can be bad. Um, usually there's no scarring. Usually it'll, it'll heal. Um, it's, you know, it's painful. Um, you know, you might have some issues with skin, you know, the hair coming back or whatever. But, you know, again, it, the big thing on this is it's going to blister. That's going to be a big difference. And mainly, and again, mainly because it's getting into the capillary bed. And then the full thickness, the third degree burn. Anybody here ever had a third degree burn? Oh, bad news. And it's weird. Um, and I, I, I had one, and it, it's an odd thing because it, the actual burn at first doesn't hurt. I don't know if yours did. Some people will say it does. Because usually it burns all of the nerve fibers. And that's just at first. Yeah, yeah it's, it's just at first. Yeah. Um, now, this goes all the way down through the dermis. Um, it is bad. Um, you're generally not going to, your skin won't recover. You're generally going to have to have skin grafts to put on the area. Um, there's definitely going to be scarring. It's, a, it's the, the worst of the burns. Yeah. It can be. It can be. Yeah, it can be. Exactly. It can be, you know, I mean, like if you have some, like some kind of acid guts on your skin, but you got it off pretty quickly, you know, you could still have just a, a, a first degree burn with that. But chemical burns can definitely do that. Um, but generally, it's more going to be some sort of heat is going to be the main way. And again, you don't have to know this, but these are, if it's over a large period of the body, a portion of the body, this is very deadly. And not from the burn, but from infections because of the skin not being able to protect you. Now, the way we talk about um, burns is we, to, to estimate the coverage, we have what's called the rule of nines. Rule of nines. And so we divide the body up into parts. Now the arms are 9% of the body surface total. So if I have a burn on my right arm, anterior, posterior, from my fingertips to my shoulder, that is a 9% burn. If I divide this up in any way, it's 4.5%. So if I, I've got it from my fingertips to my elbow, that's 4.5%. If I have it fingertips to shoulder but only on the front, 4.5%. Does that make sense? The whole arm is 9%, each arm. And if you divide, I will not ask you, like I won't divide it up into like something weird, but it would be like either the whole arm or half. Make sense? The legs are twice as big as the arms. So the legs are 18%. Again, we, that's why we call it the rule of nines because we divide the body up generally in 9%. The leg is twice as big as the arm, so the leg is 18%. So if I have a burn on my right leg from my foot to my hip, front and back, that's an 18% burn. If it's my foot to my knee, which is basically half of my leg, it's a 9% burn. If it's from my foot to my hip and it's just the back, it's still a 9% burn. Does that make sense? So far, so good. The head, the entire area of the head is considered 9%. So divide it up either way. The trunk is basically 36%. 18% front, 18% back. So if I have a burn on my back, Whatever, for whatever reason, it doesn't hit my arms and legs. It just burns my back. That's an 18% burn. If it just burns my front, it's an 18% burn. Does that make sense? 
The only area that doesn't play with that is that area. And I will not ask questions about burning that area. Not rule of nines. Arms, 9% total, and arm itself. The legs, an individual leg is 18%. The head is 9%. The trunk, 18% front, 18% back. And my least favorite slide, which I will not go over, lifespan changes, we should just say getting old sucks. All right, now we went through this whole thing, and I know I went pretty quick, 